Okay, I think we should get started. So thank you everyone for coming and listening to today's webinar. Um, firstly, just a brief introduction. I'm Saren, I'm the Science and Technology Manager at GFI Europe. Um, and I'm just gonna go through a few bits of housekeeping and general announcements before I hand over to Dr. Hammond and pass it over to him to give his talk. So um, first of all, for those of you who are new to one of GFI Science Vault Protein, seminars just to briefly introduce who we are as an organization. So GFI is an international NGO that is working to build a more sustainable, secure and just food system through transforming the way that we make meat, eggs and dairy. So specifically as part of that, we work to support scientists, industry and policymakers to enable plant based fermentation made and cultivated meat to be delicious, cost competitive and accessible to consumers globally. Um, okay, without further ado then, I'm going to introduce Dr. Hammond and then pass it over to him to, to give us today's webinar. So, John Hammond um, is a Professor of Crop Science in the School of Agriculture, Policy and Development and leads the University of Reading's research into sustainable agriculture and food systems. He has published over 80 academic papers during his career and regularly contributes to discussions on the sustainability of the UK's food production system, with his research spanning a range of crops and the sustainability of their production, such as fertilizer inputs to crops and their adaptations to heat and drought stress. So without further ado, I will now hand it over to John. Thank you, Sarah, for that lovely introduction. Um, what I want to do today is, is give you a, um, an introduction to UK protein crop production. And I think for those of you that have been to these uh, seminars in the past, um, they focus very much from what I can see on more of the food uh, production, food technology uh, side of plant-based foods. So what I want to do today is, is take that a step back to the farm uh, and the field and look at the primary production of the of the raw ingredients that go into those products, particularly from uh, a UK perspective. So before I begin, uh, just a quick introduction to the, the University of Reading and, and where I'm currently um, uh, positioned. Um, but we are a research intensive university based in the south of the UK, about 40 miles west uh, of London. We're home to over 19,000 students from over 150 uh, different countries, and we're ranked in the top 15 globally on the QS World Rankings for Agricultural Research. A key theme across the university is our research into agriculture, food and health. And we span in terms of our research and teaching that that whole value chain uh, and myself sat within the school of agriculture policy and development we focus very much on the primary production up to the farm gate of both plant uh, and animal uh, products and those interactions with the uh, with the environment um, we then hand that over to the uh, school of food and nutritional sciences where they look at the food technology, product development, and interaction of, the, of those food products with consumers, both from a sensory perspective, but also from a health perspective. And then uniquely within um, our School of Agriculture, we have the UK's largest collection of social and economic scientists um, focused on food and agricultural research, in particular, the interactions uh, of consumers with foods, um, looking at why, what decisions they make and why they make those decisions about cho choices uh, of, of foods that they make. Um, and that's supported by a comprehensive set of facilities within the university. So we uh, own uh, two farms um, around the, the, the town of Reading. Um, they house our crops research facilities that allow us to grow experimental uh, crops and do trials with crops. Um, and we also have a herd of 550 Holstein uh, dairy cows. So we're able to take a crop, feed it to a cow and, and produce a, a dairy product in our pilot plant. Um, and then we can take those products from our pilot plants um, and give them to uh, train sensory panels or consumer sensory panels, look at the flavor and sensory properties of that, and then bring that over to our medical teams and look at the impact of eating and consuming those products on things like cognitive behavior, 
and the uh, cardiovascular health uh, of the consumer, both in acute and, and long-term trials. So we have that full uh, in-house capability here at the University of Reading. So back to the uh, topic of discussion for today, uh, focusing on that um, uh, how we get those primary raw ingredients uh, uh, from the field uh, into the consumer's mouths. Um, so I wanted to start at a, uh, a global level, just to reflect on where the um, proteins that we consume come from in our diets. Um, and this figure shows quite nicely that uh, for most consumers across the globe, most of our protein already comes from a plant-based source. Um, it's only when we start getting into more affluent societies um, where meat consumption starts to um, increase, um, that starts to suppress the amount of protein that's coming from plant-based sources. So, so we're already uh, quite a good way there. What we need to do is bring that meat consumption down and, and get some substitutions in there with some plant-based sources to build that back up to what we, we need to, to be consuming. So bringing that sort of uh, down to the UK level, um, looking at what that plant-based protein looks like in a, in a typical UK diet, this, uh, this pie chart shows the sources of protein um, within a UK diet by um, sort of subgroups of, of different foods. And you can see that from, from this, obviously meat, milk, uh, eggs and fish, make up a significant proportion of that protein. But the biggest plant-based source is uh, obviously cereals and cereal-based products. So in the UK, that is bread and um, syrup, things like breakfast cereals that, that consumers um, eat on a daily basis. Um, and actually protein from vegetables and potatoes, the, the yellow colored segment here is actually quite a small proportion of the current UK diet. And that's where the plant-based uh, sort of, I guess, legume pulse products um, sit within that sector. So we're, we're starting from quite a small um, uh, section slice of the pie, as it were, uh, in that sense. So, Looking at that then in terms of where that sits from a production perspective, uh, from, from a UK supply side and where we are in terms of producing our own um, protein-based crops, excluding cereals. Um, I want to focus now on, on those crops and, and give you a bit of background on, on what we produce um, and how that's, what the trends are in, in, those, in those crops. So in the UK, our two main uh, protein, non-cereal protein crops are faba bean and peas. Uh, they're well adapted to our UK climate and we've been growing them um, successfully, relatively successfully uh, for, for many uh, decades. So just focusing to start with on faba bean uh, or field bean, um, and showing um, where we've the last 30 years of production for, for this crop. So the, um, the blue um, data here is the area grown and the orange data is the uh, production in terms of thousands uh, of tons. And you can see we've had um, a relatively uh, steady increase over the last 30 years in production um, of fava beans. Uh, and that's mirrored by a, a, an increase in uh, the area that we've been growing. But there is a lot of fluctuation around uh, that trend line. So varying so from 300 to upwards of 700,000 tonnes a, a year. Um, and that's something that we need to be looking at from a, um, a management perspective um, and a policy perspective in terms of stabilising that uh, supply. So of that uh, production, approximately 60% of fiber beans goes into human value chains, but that's mainly not for UK consumption. That mainly goes out to export to um, Egypt, North Africa, and the Middle East. Um, and so the, actually the UK consumer is not a big fan of fiber bean in its uh, raw form and, and doesn't consume uh, a huge amount of it. Um, 
And then this data, just uh, from an ag agronomic perspective, is, is looking at the yield per, in tons per hectare of this crop over the last 30 years. And again, there's quite a little bit of scatter, but we see a slight increase over that um, period of time. But I think if we want to um, maximize the potential of this um, crop, we need to be having a, a much steeper trajectory in terms of um, yield, in terms of tons per hectare that we can achieve from it. Okay, so the next crop that um, where I mentioned was the, the pea. Um, now this has had a, um, a recent dip in, in productivity um, attributed to a drop in area produced. So up until the early 2000s, we were producing around 300,000 tonnes uh, of dried peas per year. Um, and that dropped off dramatically um, in the early 2000s. And we're now around about 150,000. Um, and that's uh, reflected in a, in a reduction in the area that's actually grown and also a slight reduction in the uh, actual yields in terms of tons per hectare. And for any crop that we're growing now, we want to be seeing this uh, yields uh, in terms of tons per hectare on an upward trajectory so that we can meet the, the future demands uh, of a growing population and, and shifts in con consumer behaviour. So they're the two main crops that feature in, a, in the UK agricultural sector, um, but there are some new kids on the block, as it were, that are, are coming into uh, some of the production systems. The first one of those is lupin. Um, about two and a half thousand hectares, it's estimated, is grown, with about three quarters of that going directly into animal feeds. Um, and this reflects mainly a, a use by uh, organic farmers um, that are wanting to find uh, an alternative to imported soya, which is quite often uh, GM. Uh, and our organic certification system in the UK prevents that being used in, in meat production. Um, so it's seen a bit of a resurgence in, in the context of uh, feeding organic um, animals. Um, the next one is, is soya. Um, this had a bit of a resurgence in the early 2000s and it's starting to pick up again now. Um, about uh, 4,000 hectares grown uh, in the UK estimated. Um, and this is mainly used directly in, um, in the human value chain for, um, uh, for human um, production, um, again, in, in quite niche uh, product markets. Um, and then Others that we have within uh, the sector, at very small niche um, uh, growing areas are lentils, uh, pictured above. Um, we've been growing lentils on our trials farm successfully for, for the last couple of years, and chickpea, very small areas delivering directly into very um, specialised markets for UK produced um, and um, high value uh, uh, products. Um, and then the other, the anomaly here is, is the navy bean or haricot bean, um, which is the uh, mainstay of our baked beans, which is a, a product that we consume regularly in the UK. Uh, we consume about 100,000 tonnes a year of navy beans uh, in the form of baked beans, um, and they're primarily imported from uh, North America partly because the varieties have not been well adapted to our climatic conditions in the UK, but uh, in recent years, new varieties have started to be released to the market um, that has been, that, that are more um, adapted to, uh, to UK climate conditions. And I think we might see that uh, area start to creep up for um, locally sourced um, uh, UK grown uh, baked beans in the future. So just to summarise um, that sort of um, current situation for protein crop production in the UK, um, excluding cereals, um, the, these are contributing quite a small proportion to protein in the UK diet. And I think that's something that we need to challenge and shift. Um, there haven't been significant changes with the exception of P uh, over the last 30 years in our production of these um, pulses. So I think there's plenty of scope there to, to make that shift. Um, and there are some new crops on the horizon that I think will start to take a hold um, and uh, we'll discuss some of that in, in, in a few slides time. 
So I think everyone agrees, um, you know, it's, it's well publicized that our food system needs to change. Um, we need to make it more resilient to changing climates. Um, I was just talking before um, with Saren about the, the, the drought that we're experiencing in the UK. Um, it's rain today, um, which is um, really good for our winter drilling season. Um, but it's it's put some real pressure on on farms and production uh, this year, and that's going to impact on prices. Um, they need to reflect um, what we should be consuming. Um, so there needs to be some shifts in our diet so that we can uh, mitigate some of these impacts of, of climate as well. Um, and it needs to have a positive impact on the environment. So much of our production systems tend to have a negative impact, and we need to reverse that. So I'm just going to go into these in a bit more detail and, and, and reflect on those and what needs to happen. We're already seeing impacts of climate change on global crop production. Um, these maps are looking at maize, rice, wheat and soya um, production globally. And the blue colours are where we're seeing a, a positive increase in productivity. And the red colours are where we're seeing negative impacts due to climate uh, change on, on productivity. Um, and for some maps, there's quite a nice balance of, of red and blue, but others, um, there's a lot more red than there is blue. And it's, it's that climate pressure putting uh, on, on crop productivity um, that we need to manage going forward. And that's largely attributed to um, water availability and heat stress. Um, and this map um, shows the um, water stress and heat stress um, uh, predictions for 2025. So only a couple of years time um, where red is more, more stress on the crop and lower yields and, and blue is um, a, um, more, more water availability and less stress. And you can see um, there are a number of areas on there which uh, are dark red and that those stresses will become uh, much more um, pressured on, on the productivity. Um, and even areas that are green, so particularly I'm focusing and thinking about the UK and Northern Europe there in that image, that's where we're you know, in the middle of probably the worst drought for 500 years. And, and I think this year that colour wouldn't be green. Um, and even when we've got near normal conditions, the uh, variability in the climate can throw these um, really severe um, pressures into the into the food system. So bringing that together and thinking about what that looks like in uh, 2050, um, this uh, colour scheme on this graph looks at the percentage change in yields between now and 2050. Um, and I think the, the take home there is that um, the global south is pretty much all red um, and they're going to be huge pressures on the ability to, to yield high yielding crops uh, in those areas going future. Um, and even though the, the areas in the um, northern latitudes uh, are more green, um, that will be a change in those climates and those production systems will have to adapt to, to cope with those changes. And that will mean growing different crops or growing them in different, uh, different ways. So we've got to adapt to, to the changing climate. We've also got to adapt to um, a, a more healthy diet um, at the global level, as well as uh, in the UK. So a few years ago now, the Eat Lancet Commission released their um, um, evaluation of our current global diets. And, and the headline was that, you know, we're massively over consuming red meat uh, and particularly starchy vegetables um, and eggs. Um, and that is not good, both for uh, the human diet and the, um, the planet, planet's health. Um, and in a human health context, um, that um, gives a picture of two halves um, where we have over 2 billion people globally not getting enough nutrients in their diet and nearly 800 million not acquiring enough calories each day um, at one extreme. And at the other extreme, nearly 2 billion people um, clinically um, overweight or obese. Um, and none of the countries uh, globally on course to meet their um, uh, World Health Assembly's obesity targets. 
So we have this very um, polarized um, uh, health um, inequality um, based on the, the diets that we're consuming. And so to address that, um, we need to shift our diets. And I'm sure, you know, I'm preaching to the converted here. Um, and that means a much greater proportion of fresh fruit and vegetables in the diets. But importantly, in the, um, in the context of um, uh, this idealized plate, um, is um, a much greater reliance on plant sourced proteins, particularly from pulses and legumes. Um, so this reflects this uh, idealized plate where we want to be eating more fruits and vegetables um, uh, and less um, meats or more meat alternatives. Um, but this is a representation in that context of what we're actually producing. Um, and so we have um, a much over, significant overproduction of cereals and starches, and that's primarily there to feed um, the uh, the animal feed sector. Over uh, two thirds of the wheat produced in Europe and the UK actually goes directly into animal feeds rather than into directly into human uh, production. So we need to re re redress the balance um, and start producing um, what something more close to what we need to be consuming. Um, and then this figure um, shows where that food that's where the, globally where food is produced, where the primary market is for that food. Um, and green represents going directly into um, human consumption, whereas the purple colors here um, indicate that it's going into either feed for animals or fuel. Um, and if you think about that in the context of the earlier figure I showed where the pressures on production are going to be from climate change, um, that global south where the pressures are going to be greatest is going to really put pressure on the direct production of food into uh, human value chains. Um, and we're going to have to redress the balance here um, to compensate for that. Okay, so finally, we there's a lot of uh, press about the negative impacts of agriculture on, on the climate. Um, so climate affects agriculture, but also agriculture affects climate. Um, and we need to manage that so it has a positive impact going forward. Um, and that's based on, you know, about a quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions are attributed to uh, agriculture and food production. Um, it consumes over a third of the uh, Earth's land mass um, and consumes about 70% of fresh water globally. So it's a huge um, resource draw. Um, and I put this figure in to sort of highlight that in the, in the context of uh, nitrogen fertilizers, which are produced through the Haber-Bosch process, which is a hugely energy intensive process. Um, and those fertilizers are what drives the huge wheat production and, and maize production, soy production, uh, not soy production, sorry, um, cereal production globally. Um, and I just find this figure really interesting. This um, black dotted line here um, tracks the, the world percentage of the world population that's directly fed through this Haber-Bosch process. And it's approaching 50%. So without this process, without that nitrogen input to global agricultural systems, we would only be able to support half the, the global population. And that links and, and quite recently um, into the geopolitical impacts on food um, and the pressures that the current crisis in, in Ukraine is having on energy supplies, which are required to produce fertilizers. Um, fertilizer production consumes about 2% of the global energy uh, production. So any price increase in that is reflected directly in the price of fertilizers. So that has really brought to attention the uh, um, focus on the use of fertilizers, nitrogen fertilizers in uh, food production, agricultural production um, over the last six months. Um, and this is where we can really make dividends with the things like pulses, um, because they're obviously legumes and can bring their own nitrogen or fix their own nitrogen and not have that reliance on these uh, nitrogen fertilizer products. 
And finally, um, we need to tackle the waste situation um, uh, as part of this uh, global challenge. We have um, uh, roughly a, a similar proportion of product wasted uh, at the agricultural sort of pre-farm gate where we have more refrigerated transport systems uh, in more developed countries, uh, post-harvest and processing wastes are much reduced, but they're compensated for by a much greater uh, consumer waste uh, production. So that, that also needs addressing in this context, but not something I'll be following up on today. So there's a lot going on um, and that reflects the complexity um, of our food system. Um, and I like this slide because it is complex. It's difficult to read, it's messy. Um, and I, it's not for you to um, you know, get into and fully understand, but it's there to sort of illustrate how complex um, the food system is. Um, and this is, I guess, my sphere of influence. I'm a crop scientist. Um, I work with farmers. We talk about how to produce crops in the field. But that's only a small part of the um, of the far, of the food system, and trying to address something in that sphere is unlikely to translate into uh, a long term permanent change across the food system. So, within that context, and from a certainly from a research perspective, we're being much more we're being encouraged now um, and funded now, which is really the important thing to work more um, uh, transdisciplinary um, uh, across the food value chain um, to tackle these issues and make sure that the interventions that we're putting in in one part of it are followed through and acceptable along the, all the actors within the food value chain. Um, and that's what I want to spend the rest of today sort of uh, talking about is some of the projects that we um, we're, we're working on at the minute um, that are that are adopting this approach to try and challenge that and, and make a difference. Um, and the important thing of those is that we um, we address the sustainability issue of any interventions that that are forthcoming, and that's just not the environmental sustainability, but the economic and the social. So making it pay for both the the farmer, the processor, uh, um, the re retailer and the consumer, um, and also checking that and ensuring that the consumer um, is open to uh, the, the new products um, and they're likely to purchase and, and consume them. So the, the first project in, um, in this context is Raising the Pulse. It's funded by the UK Research and Innovation uh, Council as part of their Transforming UK Food Systems um, projects. Um, and what we're looking to do here um, is to um, improve the nutritional um, health and environmental footprint of the, the most widely consumed product in, in the UK diet, um, and that's sliced bread. So the, the project um, is there to set, uh, is to look for a step change in, in that nutritional value uh, within UK consumer diets. We've picked bread because, as I said, it's, it's consumed by 96% um, of the UK population and it contributes 10 to 12% of the energy, um, uh, calorific energy um, in, in UK diets. Um, one of the um, uh, ingredients that go into most of these. Um, commercial bread products um, is actually soy flour. So it's um, a wheat soy flour mix. And that soy flour obviously um, is imported. Um, so it's it's not a homegrown product. We, we're self-sufficient for the wheat flour, but we're relying on imported soy flour um, to as an additive in that um, bread product, which helps with the baking and, and rise of, of the loaf. So what we want to challenge and what we want to, to look at is uh, creating a homegrown market for um, fiber bean flour as a substitute for that soya flour in bread. That will help improve the environmental um, 
footprint of the, the farming operation and, and the loaf of bread because it's it will be locally sourced um, and we're hoping to improve the nutritional quality of that bread in the process. So we're taking a co-creation approach uh, with all the actors in that value chain from the farm to the folk um, and using a system-wide model to, to demonstrate the health and environmental benefits. So we've got several work packages from the farm all the way around to the consumer. And we're integrating uh, with a number of stakeholders and partners in, in this process from government agencies and um, advocacy groups to um, processes, um, bakers um, and retailers so that we can uh, ensure that at every stage um, there's buy-in and acceptability uh, for what we're doing. So the first part of that project um, is looking at the production of, of beans, and this is where I'm uh, going to be working. Um, you saw from the earlier slides, we've, we're seeing a lot of um, variability in yields, and that's one of the key things that puts a farmer off from growing beans, is that variability and uncertainty in um, markets um, and, and quality of, of the bean products at the end of the uh, season. So we'll be working extensively with, with farmers and field trials to try and um, improve that stability and yield, ensuring that we're getting good quality products that can go into uh, the processing. Um, and these are the roots from uh, some uh, plants that we've been growing this year. Um, the one on the left has been treated with a product from Legume Technology, one of our collaborators, um, which uh, stimulates um, greater rhizobial um, functions in the roots. So these little white nodules on the roots here, this is where the rhizobium bacteria are cohabiting um, with, the, uh, with the plant. And that's where the nitrogen is being fixed to supply the plant with its own nitrogen. Um, so the benefit to that is that that doesn't rely on these um, uh, imported fertilizers and um, we can, uh, some of that nitrogen will be left for the next crop in the, in the next season. So this is just some preliminary data um, from some uh, prototype trials this year. These are different uh, fiber bean varieties across the bottom, and this is yields in kilograms per hectare. Um, or, uh, and you can see the uh, control without the treated um, gives us a yield benefit uh, in some of the varieties, but not all of them. And so it's uh, really um, uh, um, something we want to sort of investigate further um, and on a larger scale to look at where that variability is coming from and how we can stabilize it. Once we've produced those uh, beans for the crop, we'll be taking them into our milling processing uh, facilities on campus and with our um, collaborators um, to look at the quality of them, uh, the processability of them, and integration into uh, finely bread-based uh, products and other products containing fiber beans. And from that, we'll be able to link that back to varieties and, and agronomic practices to see how that's altered the, uh, the quality and performance in, in the baking process. And so we've got some preliminary data um, on that. I should say it's very preliminary. These were just some test bakes that we uh, uh, undertook earlier this year. Um, and it shows uh, a white loaf produced with 100% wheat as our control, and then 97%, 3% soya mix, which is what we commonly see in our white loaf in the UK. And here we've swapped that out for 3% fiber bean, and then in a test, to see how far we could push it, uh, we've swapped it out for 25% fiber bean flour, 75% wheat. Um, and where we've got the direct swap, we get very similar values in terms of volume, color, uh, protein, uh, and fiber content. Um, and so we don't think there's any um, significant negative benefits from, from making this swap. Um, what we want to do is see if we can push this to a a greater percentage of fiber bean, um, like we've done here, where it's had a negative impact on volume 
uh, and color, but um, there's potential benefits in terms of protein and also fiber content, which is a real major um, uh, nutritional um, deficiency in, in many of our diets is that lack of fiber. So boosting that in, in the bread um, would be a real significant advantage given the consumption of that across the, uh, across the UK. So once we've got our products, we'll be putting them through um, uh, structured human trials, looking at the impact of and the nutrient availability within that, particularly iron and protein um, for, for, um, for humans. And that will be matched with more consumer attitude studies. And we'll be actually working with our students on campus where we'll be introducing these breads and other fiber bean based products into the canteens and uh, food outlets on campus um, alongside um, the traditional products and looking at um, willingness to purchase, willingness to pay um, for, for those products in, in, in a real sort of outlet setting. And then finally, we'll bring that together um, with um, uh, some, some modeling and people looking at life cycle analysis so that we can quantify both the health and the environmental impacts um, so that we can bring that to a sort of advisory um, setting for farmers, for uh, producers, um, and also importantly for policy so that we can start to influence and suggest how we can make this change from a policy perspective at a UK level um, and drive that, drive that forward. The, the second project I'd like to introduce to you is, is a new EU funded project called Leguminos. Um, it's looking at legume cereal intercropping um, for sustainable agriculture across Europe. It's led by um, Shamina Parthan at the University of Florence in Italy. Uh, it's going to be a four year project with 22 partners, and it's going to involve hundreds of on farm trials. Um, and it's focused on this legume cereal intercropping uh, concept. So, just to give you a bit of background, intercropping is where we grow more than one crop in a um, in a field at the same time um, and you can see in that picture on the previous slide we've got beans and wheat in different rows growing at the same time and this has a number of advantages um, and it is practiced globally um, particularly in uh, Africa and Asia um, is quite a common um, production method, um, but we haven't really got to grips with it uh, in Europe um, and, and the rest of the world um, as, a, as a, an efficient production system. So the benefits of, the, of growing the two crops is it can lead to a more resilient cropping system. Um, you have two crops accessing different resources, and in the case of having a legume in there, that legume can be providing nitrogen um, to the adjacent cereal crop, reducing the reliance on uh, nitrogen inputs. Um, and if the uh, environment changes or it's, it becomes extreme, it's likely that one crop may favor and, and dominate, and that will still give you a yield. Whereas if you've only got a single crop and it doesn't, and doesn't, uh, favor the, that change in environment, you can lose the whole crop altogether. Um, so having two crops in the field gives you two bites at the cherry in, in that sense. Um, it can improve yields, and I've got some data I'll, I'll share you, with you in a minute that, that demonstrates that. It also provides a greater on-farm diversity in terms of um, biodiversity. So um, the example here is some barley with a pea crop. Um, that pea crop is providing um, pollinator resources for um, bees and insects during the season. Um, it's also uh, attracting beneficial insects that may feed on um, pests and other diseases. So it increases that overall biodiversity and has an environmental benefit. Um, and, uh, and finally, as I said already, it, it reduces that reliance on, on nitrogen-based fertilizers. So these are some data that we've collected from our farm. Um, and it shows data for um, a bean, fiber bean intercrop, a lupin intercrop, 
pea into crop and then just the uh, sole crop on itself. And this value here is what we refer to as the land equivalent ratio. And it's essentially a, a ratio of how much you would get if you just grow, grew the sole crop versus what you get when you grow the crop uh, in, in an in a intercropping situation. And essentially the important thing here is anything above one demonstrates that you're actually getting more yield um, per unit area out of the um, out of this the crop than you would be if you were growing it on its own um, and the important thing here is that all of these are above one so we're having um, the the growth of two crops in the same environment is boosting the overall yield from the system and as I mentioned, that legume that's in there is also able to provide some nitrogen to the crop. Um, and this data shows, again, those wheat, bean, wheat lupin and wheat pea into crops versus uh, a wheat on its own. And we're looking here at the grain protein concentration uh, in the wheat. Um, and in the UK, we're looking for um, uh, wheat with a high protein content for bread making quality. Um, if it drops, then we end up, uh, that wheat ends up going into animal feed rather than bread making. Um, and when we get the intercropping, as we increase the proportion of the legume in the crop, we increase the amount of protein that's actually been accumulated in, in the wheat grain. And this is in a context where we've not added any nitrogen fertilizer. So in this loop in wheat crop, the wheat is actually making our um, bread making quality grade without the addition of any external nitrogen fertilizers. So I've said it's adopted in, in many places around the world, but it's not adopted widely. It's certainly in the UK uh, and most of Europe. Um, and that's because there are some challenges and barriers. And that's what we're hoping to address with, with this proposal and this project. Um, you have a mixed agronomy. You've got two crops growing in the same space. They might need different um, chemical control methods, different timings of applications of various products uh, and harvesting. So you need to manage that. Um, and that requires knowledge um, and it requires some careful crop selection to do that. You're also now coming at it uh, at harvest season and ending up with two products in one. Um, and there's a couple of challenges there. Um, if you're, for instance, intercropping um, with a wheat um, and you're actually wanting to use that legume in a gluten free product, um, that could represent a challenge um, for a processor. Uh, one of the solutions to that, this is a lentil crop that we've got growing, we had growing this year. Uh, we've intercropped it with oats um, so that we haven't got that potential cross contamination issue and also oats and lentils uh, a much bigger size difference in terms of um, the grain that's produced and it's much easier to separate. Um, lack of knowledge both from the farmer, the processor and the consumer into what these products could deliver. Um, there are clear environmental benefits um, and what we want to be able to do as part of this project is ensure that we end um, in um, uh, increase the knowledge of consumers and processors into the potential uh, market opportunities um, that could be uh, afforded by having these cropping systems and the production of both um, cereal and legumes in the same system. Um, so we'll we'll do that. Um, you know, particularly looking at the socioeconomic impacts, again, working across the value chain. Um, it's not just an agronomy project looking at whether how the best to grow um, uh, legumes and cereals. We've got partners across that um, uh, value chain so we can co-design, co-develop products and ideas um, and increase knowledge across that uh, value chain in how we produce um, um, and how we utilize these products going forward. So um, just to bring it to a close, um, Non-cereal plant-based protein production in the UK has remained relatively unchanged for the last 30 years. There are some new products and through climate change and changes in um, uh, 
market opportunities, we will hopefully see some new protein-based uh, plant crops coming into production in the UK uh, over the next few years. But in order to make that successful and avoid market failures, we have to take this whole system approach, which I'm pleased to say is, is increasingly being looked for in, in, in projects, uh, research projects. Um, but we need to do that um, to generate the whole um, uh, imp improvement across the whole um, value chain. Um, and that's going to require improvements both in the current crop production, so we need to improve yields and stability of those yields but also in the crops that we're able to grow in the UK and I think um, the crops that we've looked at the lupin, valba bean, um, soya um, are likely to be um, part of that solution uh, going forward. So thank you for your time um, uh, listening and um, I'm happy to take any questions that have uh, come up in the chat and I'm also registered for the um, networking session later as well um, so I'm happy to uh, uh, join and, and chat to any of you in more detail um, later thank you very much thank you so much John for that really fascinating presentation um so yeah I think we can just jump straight into the Q&A so I okay. see in the chat we've got first question um, that I can read out to you is from someone, I think they're referring to the your first project you were mentioning, so the Raising the Pulse project. And the question okay. was whether there was a taste difference with the 25% faba bean bread. Uh, yes, uh, I can confirm there is a taste difference, and that's something we, we want to address. We know that faba beans have off notes associated with them. Um, uh, as part of the faba bean research that we do here, we've got a... Um, a, a large collection of uh, faba bean genetic resources and one of the things that we'll be looking for are the uh, the, the, the genes and the, uh, the chemicals that create those off notes um, and looking at how we can reduce those either through breeding or through uh, processing to, to, to do that. Uh, there wasn't any noticeable difference in the three percent I should say say that. Super helpful. And then a question which is somewhat relevant um, to the to what you've just said. So there's a question about the nutrition. So does faba bean present any digestibility or bioavailability issues? Certainly does. Um, there are um, uh, obviously tannins and, and phytic acid um, within that um, within faba beans. And again, um, we're we've been looking at our genetic resources to um, to to see how we can manage that from a breeding perspective but also processing uh, that so particularly they tend to focus that tends to impact on the bioavailability of some of the minerals which is why we're very keen to look at iron bioavailability in our human trials to get a, a good understanding of, of how much comes through on that um, and, and what we can do in terms of boosting that iron um, from an agronomy perspective but also from a breeding perspective. Awesome. And then another faba bean related question we've got. Um, do you think they'll become the main pulse in the UK? And are you aware of any other projects developing ingredients from faba beans? Um, I, I, yep. So faba bean has a couple of advantages in the UK context. It's, it's, a, it's a known crop. So there is quite a, a reasonable level of sort of farmer knowledge about it, and it's it's well adapted to the UK climate. So I think in the short term it becomes um, uh, it will become a go-to pulse crop um, for for delivering you know protein-based uh, ingredients. Um, that said, there is obviously the you know, the prospect of climate change. Um, we had we've really had a very dry summer this year, and I think that's impacted some of the, our trials. Certainly um, uh, down in the south of the UK, will that be? Um, that might be a driver to start to see some um, other crops coming into UK production that that maybe take advantage of those conditions a bit more. We've got really lovely lentil crop this year. Actually, that was. <laughs> Yeah, so I had a kind of follow up question that's related to that. So you had these various graphs that showed water usage and climate change over mm. time by kind of region and, and the UK, yeah. and Northern Europe are somewhat aligned. Do you think that would be reflected in the crops that would make sense in those regions? So the, the work that you're doing would 
potentially apply to Northern Europe? Um, I think so. And I think probably will be will the, what's going on in Northern Europe now, sort of France, Germany, um, sort of Northern Spain is what we'll be looking at in terms of what we can bring into the UK over the next sort of decade. Um, and we're seeing that the example I've got is, is not produce related, but in, in wine production. So parts of the sort of south, um, southeast of the UK now have um, uh, optimal conditions for Chablais wine production, more so than the actual Chablais region in France. Um, and so we are seeing that sector really expanding in parts of the UK, taking advantage of that. And I think that's where we'll, you know, we'll be taking the, the whole, the, the productivity of, of certain crops will move north um, as we, as we, as climate change develops. That's super interesting. Um, a kind of a question that we've gotten that's related to kind of regional diversity. So someone's asking, how would you foresee your research impacting the southern part of the globe? Right, yes. Um, so so that obviously the, the, the project we've got on Faber Bean is, is very much focused on UK productivity, um, but Faber Bean is particularly important in, in North Africa um as, as a commodity um and aside from that a lot of the work that we do um within uh within the department um is actually focused on sub-saharan africa and um southeast asia areas which are really going to be prone to to changes in climate um so i've had projects in um looking at sustainability of cropping systems in the philippines and ghana uh, as two examples um so I, whilst I think the enhancing the bread is quite a specific UK um, scenario. Um, what we learn from that, it, there may be opportunities to enhance um, um, maize flour with pulse flowers in, um, in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, um, and, and develop um, you know, more, nutritious, uh, more nutritious products um, in, in those locations. Um, and then a lot of the work we do around the breeding in resilience to drought and um, heat stress, obviously those those traits uh, will be transferable to, to the, the, the equivalent crops in uh, in in the global south. Super helpful. Um, OK, looking at the next question, we've got a question about. And I think this goes back to an answer you you gave earlier. Um, but what what do you think are the best approaches for managing questions around digestibility, absorption, and availability of plant based proteins? Um, so if you've got anything else you'd like to add on that, I th yeah, I think it is around sort of getting the evidence for it from human trials and, and looking at so within our um, sort of human uh, well within our food and nutrition teams we have sort of um, artificial guts and things that we can look at digestion um, in in artificial in vitro systems um, but you know that takes a lot of variability out of you know human um, variability uh, at the genetic level and, and human variability in terms of diets and what else is being consumed along the way the downside is that they're, they're so expensive to run those sorts of, of trials on looking at um, involving humans uh, and looking at bioavailability, um, that it's a, a you know real barrier to getting good evidence for it. But um, I think that's it's it's we are sort of making inroads to that, and hopefully the the our human intervention trials will will provide some good evidence for for that um, basis. And I think going forward, um, I'm seeing and we've from a research perspective talking about things like um artificial intelligence and machine learning approaches looking at the um looking at those opportunities to take you know bits of data from you know human trials that have already gone and start to learn from those and predict what bioavailabilities and um might look like from from different matrices and different combinations of of ingredients um and i think that that might be where the where we can have a significant cost saving in that type of research is is building on that sort of computer supported learning super interesting um we have a 
a related follow-up question to that from someone else who's asked if there's any research on if fermentation has an impact on the bioavailability or biodigestibility issues posed by fava beans. Yes, yeah, so I think um, so. Certainly, fermentation and different cooking processes do affect uh, availability um, of of different proteins and, and other micronutrients within that. And we will be looking at some of that, certainly in the processing of the flours into, into breads as part of this project. Um, but we're, we're not directly looking at fermentation, but I have seen um, some papers that do sort of evidence that that is a, you know, a, a one approach to improving bioavailability um, within, uh, within barber bean. That's really cool. Um, and then a follow up question. Um, this is around the versatility of fava beans. So obviously in the first project, the intended application was in bread. And obviously, mm -hmm. as a Brit, I'm aware how much we like <laughs> bread and baked beans. <laughs> yeah. um, but do you have a sense about the versatility of fava bean, whether the, the flour or the, or the kind of isolate that you guys were generating, what the applications might look like for other products? So potentially alternative proteins and kind of meat analogs. Yes, yeah, so I think that's um, we we are so firmly based on bread because I think as a as a direct intervention at the population level, it has the biggest sort of win win. Um, but I think as part of the project, and I think we'll be having some side projects along this, we will be looking at um, alternative yeah uh, meat substitutes or producing um, burgers, you know, plant based burgers from that, um, and I. That will be, yeah, there will be some of that, but it's not the main focus. So I can't say how well that, how versatile that will lead, but I'm hoping it will work um, reasonably well in that context. And it's slightly outside of my area of expertise as a sort of crop scientist, sort of uh, the understanding what the versatility might be in a, in a, a food product um, sense, so. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so another question we've had, um, so we were asked previously about whether there was a taste difference with the fava bean flour and the bread. Yeah. Um, was there a cost difference between the soya and the fava bean flour going into it as ingredients? Um, I, that's at this stage, probably a little bit premature to, to finalize. Um, the flour we used was obviously grown on our own farm and um, it, yeah, there was a, a, we didn't do the financials on it um, at that stage. So, but as part of that modeling approach, we will that one of the factors that we will be looking at is the economic viability of it. Um, but that doesn't just include the market cost, it will also include potentially the nitrogen fertilizer benefits to the farmer that comes with growing the fiber bean crop, which at the minute are quite substantial um, uh, cost savings to a farmer. Um, so it's there there are things yeah it starts to become a lot more complicated when you factor in all those things um i think we're not obviously the trade off is we're not importing it so it's a local it would be a locally sourced product so there's no tra the transportation costs are reduced but it's at the minute not a mass market uh commodity like soya is so there's less um uh you know uh scales of economy uh, probably come into it so uh, i think that i'm waffling now and uh, i think that it's probably just safer to say it's too early to say <laughs> yeah that makes sense um okay I, I think we can go back towards your comfort zone and look at the crops themselves okay. and <laughs> into it so a question that i had um i found it really fascinating those two graphs where you had the land use dedicated towards certain crops mapped on the same graph with the actual yield that came and how the yield was so much more variable over time. Yeah. Um, do you have a sense of what the possible approaches for would be for increasing the yield? So you've mentioned intercropping in the second project um, and potentially breeding for higher protein content. What, what, what do you think the scope might be there for increased productivity? Um, I think some years we're seeing sort of, um, you know, uh, four and a half tons um, per hectare as a, as a product, and I, so I think that you know it's certainly achievable. Um, and those are they, they, those yields that I was showing are, are UK average yields. So uh, 
that either side of that as well, we are getting farmers up towards sort of five tens um, per hectare. So the yield potential is there. Um, it's just um, fact, just looking at that management and making sure that the, the genetics uh, of the crops are, are there to, to cope with that and deliver that. Um, looking at intercropping again, as you said, is, is um, another important way of trying to do that. Um, and, you know, that can give stability to the crop structurally um, as it's into with uh, in lot um, intercropped with uh, with cereal crops but um, aside from that I think um, just in many cases it's um, making sure the farmers have good knowledge um, about the, the sort of getting the basics right for for the crop um, at the start of the season um, and and in some cases showing the value of the crop both at the market and also for the rotation that the crop's being grown in. Um, if, a, if the farmer's not valuing the crop, he's not going to pay attention to it and invest in it. Um, so it's it may be that there's that um, uh, element to it as well, that there's it's not seen as a high value crop. So I'll focus on wheat um, and, and that's where I'll make my, my profits from. And, and this is just in the rotation to break the rotation up um, and, and changing that thought process into know this, there is a big market here. I've got companies asking for this product to be delivered um, and I need to focus, you know, give that equal attention to the wheat. That's super helpful. Um, okay, I think we only had one more question, um, but before I read it out, I'd just also like to echo that we've had a few people just expressing their thanks and gratitude for the really, okay. really interesting talk. Um, and yeah, it seems like people have really enjoyed um, hearing what you have to say. So the final question we have in the chat is someone asking if soy and faba beans, so they are considered allergens. Um, and I guess we're, we're back to the nutrition question again. Yeah. What, what do you think the kind of the potential approaches for managing that or what it would look like to kind of handle that yeah and i think this is something we've um i've discussed with with uh, producers in the past as well particularly around lupins as well um because that's also has to be listed as, a, as another allergen um and it, it very much depends on the process so some processes are very sort of risk averse and um are not not keen to have it anywhere near their processing production lines um others will just well you know we we already process or handle that and we'll just put a, a label on the product that that contains it um so um i think it's 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 something around the education of uh you know the consumer and the, the processor some of the things that are allergens um or have negative effects on health um that there is some research ongoing to try and read that out particularly in fiber bean um so we've now identified um uh the uh, the gene that controls the um visine convisine um production in fiber bean uh, which can lead to fibervism which is a, a human condition uh, when you consume too much fiber bean with that um particular uh, compound in it so so yeah breeding will hopefully address some of those challenges going forward and, and also to, to yeah, just um awareness raising awesome well thank you so much john for everything um You're welcome. Can we finish is there any closing remarks or messages mm -hmm. that you'd like to share with the audience whilst we have them today um i, I well um please do reach out to us um if you if you're in want any more details or, or want to follow up i would love to be able to come back in a few years time and report on some of these projects if um if the seminar series is still going and um i think yeah um uh yeah keep promoting the the use of pulses as, as best you can because that's um that's what we um you know that's going to be a big significant change in in production um and that we need to have that support from from the, particularly from the the processes um, and the market side to, to draw the farmers into growing them. Um, they won't grow them unless there's a market to sell them to. So that's uh, that's something we need to make sure we uh, invest in. Thank you so much. Um, 
Okay, well, um, so for those, yes, John, I think you, you mentioned that you'll be attending the networking session that starts in five minutes. So for those who yeah. to ask any further questions, do drop into that. And I think the registration link Renee shared earlier and was also shared separately um, when you registered to this event. Um, and also just to flag finally that our next seminar, which will be on September the 22nd, will focus on alternative facts. So do register to that if you're interested in, in having a listen. And with that, um, I think we'll close. And thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And thank you so much, John, again, for, for talking us through the research you've been doing. Oh, thank you.